Hello and welcome to the Northwood Podcast. I'm your host, Heath Jones. If you don't know me or if this is uh, your first time listening, I pastor Northwood Christian Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. And if you're in the area, you should look us up. Our website has all the stuff that you'll need to know about us. Well, some of the stuff that you could know about us. Useful information. It's www.indync.org. That's indync.org. But honestly, you could just Google it and, and find it no problem. And should you do so and look us up at our website or find our website, you'll find their statements about our convictions, beliefs, also recordings of church services past, as well as old Bible studies, recordings of those. You'll find calendar information, dates, things going on in, in the future at Northwood. And so I would love to meet you. And that's one way for you to find a point of entry into our lives and find out if you would like to, to meet us. I have two more things to say. One, if you haven't yet subscribed, liked, or followed the Northwood podcast, please pause the recording and do so by way of whatever app you're using to listen to this. This way you'll receive notice when we release new content. And secondly, lastly, please check out the other content put out by the All Indiana Podcast Network. That's who produces the Northwood podcast, for which we are very grateful. But they also produce dozens of other podcasts recorded in Indiana and about topics of interest to the state, um, at least generally, um, though not exclusively. And I encourage you to check these out. You can find them at www.wishtv.com backslash podcasts. That's wishtv.com backslash podcasts. Now, here in a moment, we'll be moving on to the meat of the episode, but first we need to pause for our podcast listeners for some ads. They'll just be a few minutes, um, so I'll catch you after this break. And we're back. Before the break, I was gearing up and almost did introduce the Bible passage that we'll be considering today. It's found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. That's Mark 9, verses 30 through 37, and I'll dive right in. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What are you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. When I was younger and training to be a pastor, we, we being fellow pastors in training, myself and other, others who were going into the ministry, well, we were made to think hard about real world ministry strategies. As well, you might understand, that's what we're going to go into the world to do in the real world, apply what we're learning about the gospel in those places. So we had classes on evangelism and outreach and how we might meet the current religious climate with the most winsome and attractive face with our message in our churches. And the stakes couldn't be higher. This was impressed upon us because the church, as you have heard for decades now, was, is in decline. Define decline. Well, the year was 2005 and the landscape for our future was bleak. If we didn't know that entering into the ministry, we would by the time that we left it. And most of us, rest assured, would leave it. 50% of pastors quit in their first five years. Only one in 10 retire in the ministry. And they, our educators, had the nerve to report statistics similar to these to us in training. The whole while knowing that we were undergrad students, most of which had gone into significant debt to be there, including myself. And 
we were told, well, these mixed messages, that we were called by God to this, true, and it was going to be great because God called us to great, greatness, and that this was what we were meant to do, but that the way forward would also be impossibly hard, if not impossible outright. So we were called to proclaim the realm of God and must be faithful to this call, but the call was seemingly only good for gluttons for punishment. And I can remember hoping then, still now, just hoping that I'd find myself one of those who made it. You know, one of the 50% of clergy who make it past the five-year mark and 15 years in. And so far, well, it has been hard. And I still hope to make it to retirement. But to get there in this economy, even as a far younger man entering into the ministry, I knew then it would be a struggle. And it has. And I graduated in 2008, right as there was that financial collapse. And just as my peers and I were entering into the workforce, it was being gutted. And that phrase I began to hear then was, the poor getting poorer and the rich getting richer. Not coined in those times, but I was hearing it really for the first time with ears that could receive it. And it's been true. And, well, let's just call it an adjustment to all what I'm describing. The church in North America has had to try to move with the times. So we were taught alongside our theology and Bible classes, classes that could be described by me as gospel marketing 101. But no, they were named things like evangelism, but their purpose seemed to me to be how to get our message to translate in a consumeristic, capitalistic landscape. For we were, or are, competing with all of the brights and shines that you see on your TV or in our entertainment venues. And church, we are told, needs to be as compelling as those things, but without losing the gospel's message. It needs to go down as artificially sweet as Pepsi without losing the heart of the message. Furthermore, we were to learn as we pastored our churches in the early years, and this was a revelation to me, that church folk also hope to find in their churches the same promises made by our purveyors of positivity. It's all around us in our culture. For example, Oprah tells us that we're all winners and that guests on shows like hers well, by way of books offered there, by guests, cures, programs, you name it, all these meant to leave you, the consumer, and Oprah's personal friend, feeling fulfilled and full of good vibes. And people in our churches, whether or not these promises can be fulfilled or not in the ways that they're being offered, they, they want to feel similar things, and I understand there is a joy that we're meant to experience in our church communities, and we do. But also, well, take the opening of today's text. We're starting with verse 30. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. Now, the next verse says that they were afraid to even ask him what he meant because they were confused, and of course they were confused. Last week, we considered the disciple Peter's reaction to Jesus when he said similar things about his inevitable suffering going forward. This confounded Peter, for he and other disciples apparently subscribed to what has been called a glory-only theology. That is, a theology that tries to convince the believer, the holder of that belief, that God only has bright skies and rainbows ahead for us. But such is not the case in our world, and Jesus knows it. So he warns his disciples of this reality again today and in previous passages that we've considered in weeks building up to this. But the disciples are struggling to understand, as is evidenced by the conversation that comes next. And this is the second of a series of conversations, or three conversations, where the disciples hear something that Jesus says about his suffering going forward and potentially their own. And the, the next conversation shows just how confused they, they are. They arrive at their destination, Capernaum to be specific, and Jesus asks his disciples what they were arguing about along the way. So this conversation has been happening on the road. 
And you can hear the silence implied here through the text, not just implied, stated. You can hear it through the centuries as the disciples fall quiet, not wanting to admit that their argument had been about, well, I mean, who's the greatest? Really? What are we, children? And ironically, in Matthew and Luke's gospel, that is the point. When Jesus welcomes a child, in those stories, Jesus tells his disciples that we must be, it's we that must be childlike to be received well into God's realm. So I'm wondering what do children know anyway? More on that later. But here in Mark's gospel, it's we who are charged to welcome the children. Not to be the children or, or like them, but to welcome them. Sounds easy. I mean, who doesn't like kids? I mean, I've met a few, but generally speaking. Well, here's what Dr. Ron Allen writes of this passage. He writes, Readers today often view children through a romantic lens that needs to be set aside when reading this text. While children were valued in the ancient Near East, they had a low place on the social order. Children here represent those in the present whose lives need reconstitution. Jesus' directive is to welcome, to receive hospitably all whom the children represent. Such hospitality points to the social reordering that will be a part of the divine realm. The community that would be great, that would achieve eternal security, is to ask, how can our life serve the realm of God by receiving and serving the figurative children of the world? That's from the commentary, Preaching the Gospel Without Blaming the Jews, by Dr. Ron Allen and Dr. Clark Williamson. End quote. And if it wasn't clear, children here represent the very lowest on Jesus's, on, on, on the community's social order, the one that Jesus is a part of. So if his disciples want to be great, really great in the ways that matter, says Jesus, it starts with humbling ourselves and then elevating those who have been relegated to the margins or discounted as less than. To do so, says Jesus, is to welcome him, Jesus himself. And to welcome Jesus is to welcome God in our midst. Then we will be great when we have welcomed the children, the least, the last. But do you know what? I think that in many ways, we modern Christians are caught up in the same conversation as the disciples in this story. In one way or another, our culture asks us to consider in what ways we are great in regards to our titles, jobs, accomplishments, or accolades of any sort, and all these ways of trying to distinguish between ourselves, who's great, me, you, the other person, and we are in many ways trying to determine who among us is the greatest, at least in our minds, whether we're able to name it out loud, here in a month or so, we'll have a series of elections that will help us decide together who we think is the, I hesitate to say, greatest. Well, at least the greatest in this very narrow context. But in the world of finance and commerce, that world is filled with people like you and me clawing for our fit and proper place. Competitions on TV pit talent against talent, idea against idea. We are told that it's a tough world out there, but the greatest will rise to the top with enough grit. Not so, says Jesus in this story. Look and see who are as unnoticed and forgotten as, a, say, a child in Palestine. And until they are elevated, lifted up, and valued, we are not great. You can meet all of the metrics of success that our culture recognizes and values, pews full in our churches, offering money, rolling in, the ability to put on a good show from the stage and from the pulpit. But if we have not welcomed and and elevated the lowly, we still will not be great. Others will think we are great. We may think we are pretty great ourselves, but we will be be as Jesus' disciples, delusional and confused in our ideas as to what true greatness is. Or 
Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all, says Jesus, Mark 9.35. Here's a question from a pastor to a pastor to everyone else, I suppose. Do you want to grow a church? Do you want to see the realm of God come into our own time and place? This is the way. Welcome the children or whoever else is forgotten. For to do so is to welcome Jesus himself. I wonder, is to ignore him the same as ignoring Jesus? Other gospel passages suggest yes. We cannot ignore Jesus and we must put Jesus ahead of us. If our churches are to be a witness in these times, we must reject our culture's value systems and assume these new eyes the gospel gives us to see by. Now, you'll notice the title of my message. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Well, what do children know anyway is what I called it. And that's a good example of me putting the cart before the horse. I read our passage from Mark 9 and at first got it all tied up with the other stories in Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus calls us not to welcome the children, but to enter into the realm of God like the children. Like children. So, I want to cheat and reach into those other texts just to make one final point. I think it's important. I think we can find it also in ours today too. Room for it there. It's because it seems as though Jesus values the perspective children bring over and above ours. Whether they are coming or going from the realm of God into or out, hopefully not out, they seem to intuitively value the things of God. Which is why Jesus keeps highlighting this, but to my question, what do children know anyway? And I thought about this. Thought about my own children. And this is what I, where my reflections went. Children at first have not absorbed the outlook or priorities of the adults around them. When my children were very, very small, they did not value possessions so much as my time or our time, their mothers and mine, or time with their siblings, their friends. And when they were young, they weren't, stressed about money. <laughs> they, they still aren't, by the way, but my 11-year-old is beginning to see money as a doorway to her happiness. She's being taught that by the adults around her, sometimes me, sometimes the advertisement she sees, the media she consumes, and these are but her first steps towards the disillusionment we must all grapple with, that money will not buy our happiness. But children don't come out that way. We, we, we teach them to want to be kings, bosses, or to play some other role of power, a title that is held up and valued by their community. I can't remember when my son began to fight for the first place in line, but at some point he did. And I wonder, will this impulse, or how it, this impulse will translate to competition in some workplace Will this impulse drive him up a corporate ladder, say, or will it frustrate him on the lower rungs? But also, and lastly, what children know is that the other children they need are just as they are. Children have not yet learned to divide themselves up by race, gender, or class. They, they receive one another as they are with curiosity and often without judgment, sometimes naming the visible differences between them, but with no judgment, because they have not learned that yet. How if we entered into our religious lives with this mindset, this mind, the mind of a child? And I don't mean here, obviously, I hope you don't think I mean that we should be simple, stupid, or naive, but rather we'll remember the wisdom we were born with that children have yet to forget. This wisdom will build our churches just as it had in the beginning. This is what always did, welcoming the least and the last and elevating them. So church, whoever you are, welcome one and welcome all. And please, whoever you are, brother, sister, friend, please take the best seat in the house. Or if you're already there, offer it up to another who needs a rest. Come in as a child and then welcome in all the other kids, all who have remembered our worth and God's love for us.